Hello, I'm Joe Trip Thompson. And I'm Lindsay Kay. And this is 24 Hours of Quarantine, a 24 hour theater event. So, typically with 24 hour theater, writers are given 12 hours to create a script, and then actors and directors are given 12 hours to put that script together as a performance. Um, so, all taking place within 24 hours. And typically, the 24-hour theater event is normally held in person, uh, but due to a, you know, sudden pandemic that is just sweeping the world, um, we have decided to transition into an online format. So we're trying something a little bit different this year. Uh, and, uh, well, I mean, I guess this is the first time I've hosted on my own a 24-hour theater event. I don't know about you, Lindsay, but... Yeah, new to me too. Yeah. So it's been an exciting sort of uh, challenge and new frontier to take on, but uh, we're excited to present four brand new plays to the world featuring the work of many actors. Um, we'll be sure to show the playbill and all of the information about the plays, who wrote them, and the actors participating in them will be in the description below. I think without further ado, I think we are good to go, Lindsay. Let's start our show. The Persistence of Memory by Hannah Orr. My name is Henry Baestros, and I directed The Persistence of Memory. My name is Lena Lincoln, and I play Skeevy, a female in her early 20s, a jaded, directionless traveler who spends all of her time reading books she knows she won't like. I'm Annalisa Parks Murphy. I'll be playing Birdie, female in her 40s, an eccentric wanderer with an interest in plants. I'm Keaton Delmar Johns, and I will be playing Ellis, a male in his early 20s, an enthusiastic traveler from a wealthy family meant to be backpacking around the world. The events of this play take place over the course of an hour, or maybe three weeks, or maybe several months. It's a bit hard to tell. We open on the common area of a hostel. The furnishings are simple, meant for the hands of strangers, but a variety of odd objects have collected throughout the space the residue of travelers who have passed through. A Brazilian travel poster is haphazardly taped to the wall near the front door, along with a flyer advertising a concert for a Canadian garage band. A large glass jug displaying a bit of Russian text rests on top of the refrigerator, and the china cabinet is filled with mugs bearing the names of cities, businesses, and colleges from around the world. In the corner, a broken computer from the early 2000s sits beside tall piles of books. Stevie reclines on the couch, reading. Bertie enters from the bedroom with a small succulent that she sets at the center of the kitchen table. She looks around. Is she gone? Not looking up from her book. Victoria? She left this morning. Oh, she didn't say goodbye. Was she meant to? We're not her friends. Yes. But our paths crossed, our lives overlapped for a moment, and now we'll never see each other again. Our lives overlap with others constantly. Do you really expect every stranger you encounter in the supermarket to stop and say goodbye before going to the meat department? I don't share a glass of wine in conversation with every stranger I come across, and I think sleeping under the same roof makes it different. It expresses vulnerability. A certain level of trust. I wouldn't say goodbye to you if I left. I suppose I should have seen it coming. Her eyes lacked a certain softness required to maintain deep connection with human beings. She wasn't a goodbye person. You can usually tell a few minutes into meeting someone if they're a goodbye person. There's either a light in their face or there isn't. Victoria lacked that. Bertie exits the room momentarily. Stevie continues reading. A small spider emerges from the bedroom and begins making its way slowly towards the basement. Bertie returns with the pathos plant, and she sets it lovingly on the side table next to the couch. 
As she arranges its vines, Ellis enters from the front door, carrying a large backpack and a small box containing a pastry. Oh, hello. Are you just getting in? Uh, been here a few weeks, actually. I'm just not around much. Oh, you're the one in the basement, yes? That's me. Sorry to not have introduced myself. I wasn't planning on staying long, but then I did, and now I am. <laughs> I'm Ellis. Bertie, you have soft eyes. There's a light about you. Ellis nods. Bertie glances at Stevie, expecting an introduction. Stevie flips a page. Says nothing. Um, this is Stevie. Good to meet you. Where are you from? Nowhere, really. I mean, I was from somewhere, but I haven't been there for so long. I don't know if I'm still from there. I'm rather from here now. You live full time in the hostel? No, I'm just staying. I just don't know when I'm leaving. Neither does Stevie. We've both been here for a while. Oh, that's interesting. I suppose. She goes back to arranging the pathos. What is that? Oh, um, it's kind of my new hobby. I've been reading a lot into the qualities of plants, and I think there's something there. Like something more than people even talk about. They have certain abilities, I believe. Like what? Healing. Guidance, companionship, it's a whole untapped world of expression and wholeness. It's really a sort of medicine for the soul. Oh, that's very interesting. It really is. I'm hoping to study it more. There really hasn't been enough research into the deeper, supernatural qualities of plants. Is that why you're here? Is it a good place to study them? Well, it could be, I guess. There's a nursery down the street, and they have good prices. But it's not why you originally came. No. A silence. The spider struggles through some carpet in the lower level of the living room. Ellis watches it for a moment. What are you reading? I don't remember the title. She's always reading these books that she knows she won't like. It makes her feel powerful, like it proves that these people aren't better than her just because they published a book. Stevie flips her off without taking her eyes off the page. So, why are you here? I'm trying to see the world, or, uh, I was. My parents are rich and dull and wanted me to grow up to be rich and interesting, so they agreed to finance my trip. But, well, I like it here. I'm having a hard time moving on. Bertie seems to have lost interest. She's gone to the kitchen table and is moving and turning the succulent, pausing to note the effect. There's this girl. She runs the bakery a few blocks down. She's, well, um, she's great. She's pretty and kind, and she makes these pastries. God, these pastries, they're so incredible. And she's so incredible. And I could be wrong, but... I think I'm in love with her. Bertie quietly exits in search of another plant. I know what you're thinking. How can you know? And I would have said the same thing, but I do. I really do. There was this moment the other day. I was sitting in the shop eating one of these pastries, just absolutely in heaven. And she walks in with a fresh tray. And there was just this perfect spot of flour right on her nose. And little splotches all over her apron. Oh, it was beautiful. I couldn't help but picture the flour and the pastries like little interwoven patches of jewels in her dress, like she was a Klimt painting, her glory magnified in gold leaf and paint. And I just thought, I love this woman. And it surprised me to think, but it's true. She's my soulmate. Have you spoken to her? Of course. She asks me what kind of pastry I want. I ask her what her favorite is. It's brimming with innuendo. What's her name? Her tag says Emilia. But you haven't spoken about her life. I know her life. She makes pastries. Wonderful pastries. <laughs> You're not in love with her. How could you know that? I know. That's absolutely ridiculous. I think I know my own heart and my own soulmate better than you do. What's her father's name? What's her favorite movie? 
Um, well, well. You don't know her, so you can't love her. I know enough. I love what I do know. Which is basically nothing. So if I went down there right now and had a conversation with her, got to know everything about her, would that convince you that I love her? Maybe. Fine. As you wish. I'll be back. He walks confidently back out the front door. Some time passes. Bertie brings out another plant, places it, and exits. Stevie finishes her book, snorts in disgust at the ending, and gets up to replace it with another one from the pile in the corner. She selects one and returns to her place on the couch. Bertie enters with another plant, places it, and goes. The spider has made it to the center of the room. Stevie stares at it for a moment, then returns to her book. Bertie enters with two more plants, places one in the corner, and one on the side table near Stevie. The leaves block her light. Does that need to be there? It feels right, like the plant is asking for this spot. I think placing it here will bring us a lot of comfort. And what makes you think that? It's a feeling I get when I look at the plant. That's ludicrous. So is reading books you know you'll hate. Fuck you and your stupid plants. Moving the plant. Your negativity is toxic. Oh, so now the plant wants to be somewhere else? You've damaged that spot. It wouldn't be able to survive there. Unfortunately, that also means we'll miss out on the comfort it had to give. I hope you're happy. Perfectly. She flips the page. Some time passes. Bertie continues to bring in more plants. The spider, tuckered out and discouraged with the distance remaining to the basement, has decided to weave a web around the stage left banister. After a while, Ellis returns wearing a triumphant smile and a larger box of pastries in his hands. I did it. I know everything about her. How? You've barely been gone long enough to walk to the bakery. I spent over an hour with her. Her father's name is Quinn. Her first pet was a small lizard named Potato. Her favorite movie is Chocolat. And I love her. I love her even more, perhaps, definitively and fully. And what does she want from life? To run a bakery, presumably. Did she tell you that? Does she have to? If you loved her, you would care about her dreams. Fine. I'll go ask her. But this isn't going to change anything. Whatever. Bertie brings in plants and exits. The room is beginning to fill like an overfull greenhouse. The spider is making progress with its web. It weaves a beautiful octagon it's particularly fond of. Stevie nears the end of her book. Bertie carries a large potted fern. Could you move over a bit? What? This plant wants to sit on the couch. I thought my negativity was toxic. This one's resilient. Her goal is to heal you. And she thinks the couch is her best shot. Oh, she can think, can she? In a sense. They interpret and send out energy. It's not the same as our thinking, but it's real and meaningful. Are you going to move? Stevie grudgingly makes room for the fern. Thank you. She appreciates it. Stevie stares at the plant for a moment. Why are you here? I was traveling. I needed a place to stay. No, but why are you still here? I'm studying plants. You're not. You're collecting them and talking about them and listening to them, apparently. But you're not studying them. I mean, you're kind of just making all this stuff up, aren't you? That's not for you to say. It's true, though, right? And even if it wasn't, you could just study plants or whatever you call it somewhere else, couldn't you? You don't have to be here in some halfway home filling every living surface with a pot. Why don't you go home? Don't you have a life? A job? I don't see you going home. That's different. I don't see how. I'm in a transitionary period. I haven't settled into a next step yet. It's a liminal space. So, why haven't you chosen a next step? You've been doing nothing but sitting and reading. Hasn't that given you enough time to think? It's complicated. Maybe I don't want to think. Maybe I don't want to study plants somewhere else. Fine. 
but there has to be something you're avoiding back home, whatever that is. What is it? Are you afraid of something? There doesn't have to be anything. I'm an accountant. It's nothing to be afraid of. I just like being here. It's boredom then, isn't it? You're bored of your life and you're running from it. Or maybe you're scared and bored of your life and projecting it on me. Whatever. But I'm not sitting on this couch next to this stupid fern. She gets up and moves to the chair in the corner next to the pile of books. Bertie smirks and exits to retrieve another plant. Some time passes. The spider completes its web and looks proudly on it. Ellis walks in the front door proudly, stops for a moment to search for Stevie in the sea of plants, and crosses to her at the desk. I've done it. Amelia and I had a wonderful dinner together, and a walk through the park by the moonlight. And she told me, with her own beautiful voice, that her golden life is to run a bakery. Bully for you. Wait, did you say you had dinner with her? Yes. We went to this lovely little cafe down the road, which, by the way, is her favorite restaurant. I know that, too. I know it all. But how? You've been gone, like, five minutes. No, it's been hours. I even spent the night at her apartment. Did you sleep? Have you just been reading all night? I, I guess so. I, I could have sworn you just left. Well, the point is, I'm still in love with her. And I hope you're satisfied, because she certainly is. She asked me to marry her. What? What did you say? Yes, of course. I mean, I'll have to figure out how to tell my parents, but how could I not say yes? I'm in love with her. She's my soulmate, and nothing could ever change that. It's just a little early, don't you think? I know it's only been a few months, but it feels like we've spent a lifetime together. She's my soulmate. I know this is right. Months? How long have you been here? Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, it's your life, I guess. Thank you. I'm gonna pack up a little. If we're getting married, I might as well move in with her, you know? He exits to the basement to gather his things. Stevie finishes her book and is picking up another one from the pile when an envelope falls onto her lap. Bertie enters with some more plants. The room feels more like a forest or an overgrown garden than a hostel. Stevie looks at the envelope with curiosity, opens it, and reads. Her eyes widen as she finishes it, and she searches for Bertie amid the foliage. Bertie! What is this? Where did you find that? In a book. You've been hiding this from me. Who is Angela? I haven't been hiding anything. It's just an old letter from someone I don't know anymore. It's nothing important. She said she was flattered by your offer, but she has to refuse. What did you ask her? Nothing. I told you. It's not important. Bertie, didn't you say there was a vulnerability and trust to sleeping under the same roof? Where's that now, huh? Be vulnerable with me, Bertie. Who is Angela? She was a girl I knew in college. Happy? And what was your offer to her? I asked her to run away with me. You what? She was a girl I knew in college, and I thought we would be happy together. But she didn't. I was young and dumb and thought that if I shaped my life to be what I thought she wanted, it would work out. I was wrong. What did you do? I became an accountant because she said she wanted stability. But she changed her mind. So I got a job at a firm and tried to forget her while she married a yoga instructor. I worked there until I couldn't stand to make eye contact with myself in the mirror, and now I'm here. So, you're running from her? Or from the version of yourself you became for her? From the guilt of who you never were? No, I'm not running. I'm studying plants. But don't you ever want to go back? You could change your career, fix your life. You could be who you want to be. That's what I'm doing. I'm studying plants. It makes me happy, and it heals me. Why would I want to go back? So you're just going to ignore your unhappiness forever, then? Live in some fantasy life abroad and forget about your real feelings? So you're just going to sit here and ignore the inevitable choices in your future? Live in some made-up liminal space instead of confronting your own insecurities? 
Ellis bursts in from the basement, very sad. I can't do it. I can't. What? What's going on? Bertie uses Stevie's distraction to quietly exit, seeking more plants. I was there in the basement packing up my things, and I found this old pastry box, and it just came to me. I don't love her, Stevie. I don't. I don't care what her dreams are or her favorite movie. I love the pastries. If it weren't for those pastries, I wouldn't be able to stand being in a room with her. God, what do I do? You tell her. You end the engagement. I can't do that. How do you look a human being in the eye and tell her that you only love the little doughy desserts she bakes? That everything you've been telling her is a lie and you don't want to spend your life together? How do you marry a human being knowing that you can't stand to be in the same room as them? I... I could leave. I could just go and never speak to her again. She would figure it out. Or maybe she would think I died or disappeared. She could warn me and move on. She would never have to know it was all a lie. That's a terrible idea. It's brilliant. But I need to go now before she comes looking for me. We were supposed to have dinner together, and that's in an hour. I'm going. Thank you, Stevie. Please don't thank me. He packs up his backpack and exits. Stevie returns to the couch with a book. Some time passes. The spider settles into its web for a long nap. Bertie re-enters and adjusts a plant. After a moment, she looks up and examines the room. Is he gone? Alice? He left this morning. Oh. He didn't say goodbye. Was he meant to? We're not his friends. End of the play. The Seance by Trinity Itty Rodriguez my name is Tara Dole, and I'm playing Helena. She's in her early 20s, and she's a young woman who hopes to reconnect with her dead boyfriend, Boyd, with the help of Jesse. Hi, I'm Tanner Horan, and I'll be playing Boyd. He's in his early 20s, he's a ghost, and when he was alive, he was Helena's loving but not-so-attentive boyfriend. Now that he's dead, he's commitment-free. I'm Caitlin Hodges, I'm playing Jesse. Jesse is in her mid-30s and is a psychic who runs operations out of her house. She's a bit flighty and may not be that qualified. Lights come up. We see the living room of a house. It has a couch, two side tables, and a TV on a stand. Helena sits awkwardly on the couch, bouncing her leg and tightly holding her purse. Jessie frantically tosses silk scarves, tapestries, and Navajo-style blankets across the average middle-class living room in a piss-poor attempt of making it look exotic. Sorry, if I knew you were coming early, I would have already had everything prepared. Jesse pulls one of the side tables to the middle of the couch and sits on the left side opposite of Helena. As Helena speaks, Jesse produces a crystal ball, a bowl of sage with a feather in it, and a deck of tarot cards from inside the table and places them on top. Shouldn't you have seen me coming? I mean, because you're a psychic and all. What are you, a cop? No, no, I'm just trying to lighten the mood. I'm just nervous. Don't be, honey, don't be. I promise you, you will see your beloved bird again. Jessie grabs a scarf off the couch and ties it around her head. It's Boyd, actually. His name was Boyd. Boyd, bird, whatever. Now, tell me the juicy stuff. How did he die? I'm not sure if I'm comfortable telling you that. Well, you have to tell me. Or else... Or else I won't be able to summon your boyfriend so you can say your last goodbye you never got to have. Is it really necessary? Jessie hops up from her spot and grabs Helena's face, locking eyes with her. I have to know. She lets go of Helena's face and sits back down. Well, I came home from class one day and he was just slumped over in his gaming chair. The TV was still on. No pulse, so I called an ambulance. There wasn't anything they could do. He was gone. Afterwards, they told me he had thrown a blood clot in his brain. I wasn't home. I couldn't help him. I, I didn't even get to say goodbye. He was the one I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, and I just came home, and he was gone. That's why I came to you. I need you to help me speak with Boyd just one last time. Ah, uh, well, that was rather anticlimactic. Boring. But don't worry, Helena. You'll see your bird in no time. Now, did you bring what I asked for? 
Um, his name is Boyd, and yes, I did. An article of clothing, an item that ties him to me, and $400 in 20s and 5s. She places a dirty college hoodie, a framed picture of Boyd and herself, and a wad of bills on the table. Now, can we begin? All in due time, Helena. All in due time. Jessie stands up and begins to stretch. She touches her toes, swings around, and attempts to do a sort of chant. She grabs the sage, lights it, and swings her arms around, speaking in tongues. It's all really bad, though. <clears throat> can we start? Uh, I guess I can cut my prep short. He's not going anywhere, you know. He's dead. D-E-D. -D. Dead. Deceased. Gone. No longer of his mortal foil. She sits back down, cracks her knuckles in a forward motion, rolls her neck, and spreads the tarot cards around in a large messy pile around the table. She waves the feather erratically and places both of her hands on the crystal ball dramatically. We are here to summon the spirit of Bird Johnson. Boyd! Uh, the spirit of Boyd Johnson, so that his girlfriend, Helena Holmes, may see him one last time. We offer the spirit one of his favorite hoodies and a framed photo of him and his beloved. Arise, spirit, and greet thy lady, for she misses you so. Jessie leans back to pretend that she's possessed by the spirit of Boyd. As she does, a blue light emerges from the crystal ball. It flares up and reaches the ceiling. The lights flicker, and the hoodie floats from the table and fills out. There, in all his ectoplasmic glory, is Boyd. He's a scruffy young man who looks like he spends too much time in front of a computer screen. Think Fry from Futurama. Jesse crawls up the couch in fear and perches on top. Another dub for me, D-Man. Let's run it back! Boyd! Holy shit. I didn't think that was gonna work. That's never happened before. Boyd notices Helena. Actually, Luce, I'm gonna have to log off for a bit. He slides his gaming headset off his head and places it around his neck. Helena, is that you, babe? Boyd, I can't believe it's you. I miss you so much, honey. You don't even know. When they pronounced you dead, I didn't know how I was gonna... God, babe. Why do you always interrupt my game? First it was walking in naked, then it was walking in with the pregnancy test. Then it was you crying about some Mrs. Carey chick. And now this? I was totally destroying Satan himself and Cod. I told you, babe, only interrupt me if you have pizza rolls or beer. You were playing video games with the devil? As in hell? You went to hell? Honey, what happened? I don't know. I died from a blood clot that was caused by my constant yanking and gaming, so maybe it was one of those seven deadly sins. Sloth, maybe. I don't know, babe. But you were a good man. You didn't kill anyone, never stole anything. You were good. You don't deserve to be in hell. Look, babe, it's not up to me. You do one bad thing that's big enough and you end up in the bad place. It'll happen to all of us. I don't know what I did to land here, but I know it's bitchin'. I play video games 24-7, I get to nap the rest of the time, and best of all, no daggy girlfriends! What? Yeah, babe. I'm just enjoying my time until you wind up here and get on my ass again. And trust me, you'll end up here. I'm pretty sure the big guy doesn't like witchcraft, babe. Helena has woken up from the trance of loving Boyd and realized that he is, and always was, a distant asshole. How could you say that? Well, I'm out of here. <laughs> Glad I could help. I'll be in the, um, uh, in the powder room if you need me. She grabs the wad of cash and runs into the bathroom, locking the door behind her. Be honest, babe. You were a bit of a nag. How could you say that? I dedicated my life to you. I wanted to marry you. You were going to be the man I spent my life with. You may not know why you ended up in hell, but I do. You never loved me. You led me on so you could have a place to game and sleep. You're a slovenly, lazy, horrible, horrible man. I hate you. You weren't... 
I thought you were a priceless Van Gogh, but you're a four dollar Walmart poster. You know what? I'm glad you're dead. I'm glad I found you slumped over in your damn chair, and I'm glad I came home too late to do anything about the blood clot you threw from spending all your time sitting on your bony ass. I wanted one thing from you. Love. And you couldn't give it to me. You just took and took and never gave me a single thing. I am done trying to get things from you. Fuck you, Boyd. You're a bad man. Get out of here. I never want to see you again. Go back to playing video games with the devil. Babe, I... Goodbye, Boyd. As she says goodbye, the blue light flashes again. Boyd disappears, and the sweatshirt flops to the earth, knocking over the photo of Boyd and Helena in the process. Helena picks up the sweatshirt and squeezes it in a quiet rage. Asshole. Helena spits in the sweater and throws it as hard as she can across the room. She grabs her purse, stands up, and heads to the front door. The door slams shut as she leaves. Blackout. The end. This is Fair Weather by Sean Millicher. My name is Keaton Delmar Johns, and I will be playing Daniel. He's 25 years old, and he's an office clerk who enjoys theater and the arts, but could never make a career out of it, at least not according to his mother. I'm Annalisa Parks Murphy. I'll be playing June. He's 25, female, a first-year real estate agent, smarter than she lets on, but couldn't afford to go to college and this is where she thinks she can excel, better than her previous waitressing gigs. My name is Henry Baestros, and I directed this piece. The time is 11 p.m., December 17th, 1975. Place, a small, one-bedroom New York City apartment, a fifth-floor walk-up. The living room is lightly furnished with a couch, a coffee table, a side table, and a television set. The adjacent kitchen-slash-dining room has a table, three chairs, an oven-stove combo, a sink, a cupboard above the sink, and a refrigerator. In the back corner of the apartment, there leads a door to the bedroom. There is a Christmas tree in the corner of the room, unlit, with a few handcrafted ornaments hanging from its branches. There are no presents underneath the tree, despite it being one week from Christmas. Daniel is sitting on the couch in the living room, lacing up his winter boots. Junie, are you almost ready? I want to get a table at Sevilla before it gets too packed. June enters from the bedroom. Sorry, I, I couldn't find my coat. It was at the bottom of the closet. Must have fallen off the hanger after I washed it last week. Does it look all right? Should I wear a different coat? This is the only one that matches. Yes, it looks fine. Fine? As well as a wrinkled old coat can. <laughs> That's funny. Are you as excited as I am? Just ecstatic. I'm convinced a chorus line is the greatest musical ever written. You can't change my mind. Said I was trying to. The opening number alone is a feat of musical theater. It is. The score, the story, everything about it. What's your favorite song? I don't know. The tits and ass song is pretty funny. Dance ten looks three, and I'm still on unemployment. Dancing for my own enjoyment. Oh, come on, you can join me if you'd like. That ain't it, kid. That ain't it, kid. <laughs> there you go. I'm not a singer. You know that. Maybe you'd be better cast as Christine. She's supposed to sing terribly. Thanks for the compliment. I didn't mean that. I meant that you'd have an easier time singing that song than me. Because of your perfect pitch. I know. I really think I could have made something of myself. Then you should have made something. Maybe you could have been in this show. You know my parents would never have let me. So for now, I'll live vicariously through Zach and Cassie and Paul and Diana. Okay, Mr. Broadway baby, let's go. Do you want to turn the heat off before we go? Not really. The place will be frozen by the time we get back. So what's the point of leaving it on? Mostly so the pipes won't freeze. But I also don't want to catch hypothermia in my own apartment. But that's just wasting electricity. And besides, the pipes won't freeze in six hours. Since I'm paying the electric bill, I'll decide whether we turn the heat off. Okay. I won't argue. Glad to know I'm valued in this relationship. Of course you are. I love you. I know you do. The show will cheer you up. We better get going. Yeah, I'm starving. Do you like Sevilla? I don't remember. It's all right. 
Their paella is to die for. Was pretty good. Daniel and June exit their apartment. A few hours pass. Daniel and June enter their apartment. They take off their jackets and boots. How you convinced me to live on a fifth floor walk up is still beyond me. When did stairs get so hard to climb? I tried to warn you. Besides, it's a good workout. I don't need to work out. I froze off all my fat on the train home. Holy shit, it's like the Arctic outside. Is this your first winter in the city or something? <laughs> That's funny. I thought you'd be used to it. Didn't you grow up in Long Island City? I've always been more of a summer kind of guy. I can't stand the city in the summer. It's a million degrees outside. It feels like you're standing in boiling water. So? I'd rather not get frostbite walking two blocks to the subway. Can't even sleep in the summer. At least in the winter you can bundle up if you want to. You can't really bundle down once you're sleeping naked on top of a single bed sheet. I know what you're going to say next. Yeah? Enlighten me. You're going to go on another spiel about why we need an air conditioner. We do need an air conditioner. We've gotten on just fine without it. I'm done putting my sheets in the freezer before I go to bed, Danny. Do you want to pay that electric bill? Because if so, then be my guest. <laughs> You're lecturing me on how I should spend my money? Oh, this ought to be good. I'm only saying, maybe if we didn't go out as much, maybe we'd have a few dollars to make this place bearable. We hardly go out. I'm talking about the shows. So what's wrong with seeing a show now and then? It'd be fine if it really was now and then. This is the fifth time we've seen a chorus line since it opened, less than six months ago. There's no way it's been five times. Well, I took you opening night for your birthday. And I'm very glad you did. And then you took me for my birthday. Because you liked it just as much as I did. And for our anniversary. Because it was something we could enjoy together. And then you took us for your mother's birthday. Of course I'm going to take my mother to a show for her birthday. She's the one who got me into it in the first place. Ever since she took me it to took see West Side Story. took you to see West Side Story when you were 10. I know why. So why did we have to go tonight? It was an early Christmas present. <sighs> Gee, I can't wait to see what I get under the tree this year. I don't want to spoil the surprise. Then don't. I won't. Do you want to hand me your coat? I'll go hang it up for you. Sure. I'm making tea. Do you want any? I'll take a cup, please. Thank you. Daniel grabs June's coat and exits to the bedroom. June walks to the kitchen. She grabs the kettle from the cupboard. She fills the kettle with water. She puts the kettle on the stove and ignites the front right burner. She walks to the Christmas tree and stares at the floor below, taking in the lack of gifts. She grabs an ornament off the tree. It is a glass ornament she made for Daniel their first Christmas together. She holds it in her hand and walks to the TV. She turns on the TV and it plays the nightly news. She turns off the TV. She looks at the ornament in her hand. She walks back to the Christmas tree and hangs the ornament on its proper location. The tea kettle whistles. She walks to the kitchen and moves to the kettle to the front left burner. Daniel enters from the bedroom. He has changed into his pajamas. Thank you. You look comfortable. I am, thanks. June takes two teacups from the cupboard. She pours them tea. You want honey in yours? Uh, honey, and if we have any left, some lemon too, please. We don't have any left, sorry. Are you sure? Yes. I checked while you were in the bathroom. If we had any lemons, I would have asked if you wanted any lemons with your tea, but since we don't have any lemons to go with your tea, you don't get any lemon in your tea. I got it. No lemons. You don't have to bite my head off. Daniel walks to the kitchen. He grabs his tea. June sits at the kitchen table. <sighs> Where are we going? Daniel walks to the couch. Daniel? I don't know what you mean. Come off it. What's this about? I don't see us going anywhere. Really don't. Let's face it, I don't think we're right for each other. What do you mean? We have so many things in common. That's just it. I don't think we do. I know you like theater, and don't get me wrong, it's been nice. But I don't think it's for me. It's your life. I know you're not happy at work. 
from the first day you came home from the office. You complain almost every night during dinner. It's becoming insufferable. You don't even ask me how my days are. You don't remember the last time you asked me how I'm feeling. You should have asked me if I wanted to go out tonight. And I would have been honest and told you no. You just come home and surprise me with tickets to a show. And suddenly my hope of a quiet evening at home is ruined. So I put on a facade of joy and gratitude when I really don't feel anything. And I don't think you do either. I know what you're doing, Danny. You think that taking me out and giving me gifts are what I want and are what's going to make me stay. That's not it at all. I want to settle down. I want a husband and someday kids. Is that what you want? I don't think that's what you want, Danny. I know that's not what you want. So what is it? What do you want? Where do you want to go? I know, whatever it is, I can't give it to you. I can't be there with you. Daniel gets up from the couch. He turns on the TV. It plays the nightly news. He returns to the couch. June gets up from the kitchen table. She walks to the couch, stopping halfway to look at the Christmas tree and the ornament. She sits on the couch opposite Daniel. They sit and drink their tea, lemonless. The end. The Art of Disagreement by Camille Osborne. I'm Tara and I'm playing Andy. A wannabe novelist and she's super cynical. She has a love-hate relationship with the other roommates. Hi, I'm Jeremy Allen. I am playing Henry. He's 22, a film major, a self-proclaimed Mr. Always Right, and best described as high intelligence, low wisdom. I am Tanner Horan, and I'll be playing Boris. Uh, he's 23, he's reactive, doesn't really know what he's doing with his life. Definitely reincarnated from the Cold War. Though the other two think he's just your average American in his 20s, depressed and filled with rage. Andy sits at the kitchen table, staring intently at her computer. Henry enters from the living room area and picks up a banana. Andy doesn't notice him. They sit in silence for a minute. Henry seems a bit annoyed that she won't say anything to him. She looks equally annoyed that he's not asking her what she's doing. Finally, Andy speaks. Why does everyone in the Last Supper only sit on one side of the table? I am so glad you asked. Yes, I got an A on my paper on Alfred Hitchcock. A beat. That isn't what you asked, is it? No, not even close. Another beat. Well, uh, what did you ask? Andy sighs deeply and turns her computer towards him. The Last Supper. Why are they all sitting on one side of the table? I mean, did Da Vinci just show up and tell them all to sit on one side of the table for a few minutes so he could paint this? Henry doesn't say anything for a second. He just looks confused. Andy, you do realize that this was painted long after all of these people were dead, right? No. I mean, how could he paint something if he didn't know what it looked like? How did Greta Gerwig direct Lady Bird? How did Leonardo DiCaprio give a gut-wrenching performance in Titanic? How did Gone with the Wind get away with the first use of a swear in the history of film? He says nothing but just stands there. And he waits expectantly. Um, I have no idea. It, it's because I'm not finished. One more moment, then very dramatically. Imagination. No such thing. You're a novelist. Uh, actually, no. You're a failed novelist who's never actually finished a book. I just haven't had a good idea yet. Besides, you haven't won an Oscar yet, so which one of us is really the bigger failure? Also, imagination only exists for tiny children who still believe in fairies and haven't realized that the world's a hellish place. Once you turn 11, imagination is no longer a thing and you begin your descent into misery. I mean, a fair. But that still doesn't explain how anyone creates. According to you, how does creation happen? Well, one night, a man and a woman turn on the Nature Channel. They get bored, then give each other the look. 
Then a broken condom and nine months later, a screaming parasite enters the world. Creation, not procreation. Fine. I'll bite. Observation. We all watch the world and steal our ideas to pass them off as our own. How often do you hear a song on the radio and think, hey, this sounds a lot like another song that came out 30 years ago? Basically, what happened is we were told not to plagiarize when we were 13, then we all went and did it anyway. No! I mean, that would explain why you've never had an original idea, but no! What do you think, then? Imagination is human nature. We are curious, we want to create. If there's no imagination, there's nothing new. So we're on the same page. Uh, no! Have you ever watched Midsummer? That movie created such raw terror. And it was new, interesting, unique. No one had ever made a horror film like that before. It was a new concept. A movie filled with light and color. And it was still deeply disturbing. You can't tell me that that did not come from a place of imagination. Andy doesn't respond. In fact, it seems like she isn't even listening. Andy! Sorry, I see your mouth moving, yet I hear nothing. Oh, you're impossible. Right back at you, pal. Boris runs in from outside, looking very frazzled as he locks the door. They're coming! He dives under the table. Who's coming? Oh, you know darn well who, Henry. If that's even your real name. Who's coming? The Russians, Andy, the Russians. We need to get to the basement. I have enough food to last me a month. I'm sure you can grab something on your way down, though. Henry stands to make a move. Not you! You can stay up here, you communist. How many times do we have to go over this? I am not a Russian spy. That's exactly what a Russian spy would say! Not necessarily. Have you even watched Bridge of Spies? They made a whole bridge out of spies? Worse than I thought. No. Ugh. You know, I don't think he's a Russian spy. He's not smart enough. Hey, 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 I'm a genius. I graduated top of my class. I was voted most likely to succeed. I can grasp concepts that you don't even comprehend. Like imagination, apparently. And yet, here you are, living with a couple of college dropouts in an apartment in the middle of a murder town because the rent is cheap. Wow, you got me! I'm enlightened! Sorry for insulting your intelligence. Next time I'll go for your massive ego. Henry opens his mouth to speak, but decides it would be better not to. No, I really am curious. Why do you think he's a Russian spy? He's got the vibe. Look at him. Looks like he's hiding something. Is an air of superiority, which we all know Russians are raised with. They're raised to hate Americans. And he has never once looked at anyone with an ounce of kindness. I once entered the kitchen to microwave a can of soup, and he glared daggers at me. There is nothing more American than microwaving a can of Chef Boyardee, and he hated it. I went into the living room one day, and he was watching some Russian movie. Who would watch a film in another language unless they understood it? Especially if the language was Russian. I bet if I walked into his room right now, I'd find a big red communist flag waving proudly in the breeze coming out of the AC. Oh, don't look at me like that, Andy. You know I'm right. He's a cold-blooded commie through and through. He's got the whole house bugged. It's only a matter of time before we're sold to Putin where we will be tortured for information. We can't let him have it. We can still win, but we have to be vigilant. Andy looks downright amused. Henry looks like he wants to say a million things, but has no idea where to start. So, is that why you dropped out of college? So they wouldn't have any information or knowledge to steal? That is exactly why I dropped out of college. How did you know that? Spy? 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 You know what? You make a lot of valid points. I will definitely consider it. Oh, come on. You can't be serious. I mean, really. Why would you be watching a Russian film? I had the subtitles on. It was a work of art. If we never break out of our own cultural boundaries, we miss so much. 
how can we deny ourselves the opportunity to observe art just because it's different? No one cares. What do you have to say for yourself? Bye. Hey, I'm not. Besides, I'm not the one with the Russian name, right, Boris? Boris looks taken aback. Are you suggesting I'm the spy? Hey, you said it, not me. Boris goes through an identity crisis. I... I never thought of this. Oh no. This is new information. I need to process this. I'll be, I will be back in an hour. We will regroup with a new battle plan. You're off the hook for now, but you are on thin ice, my friend. Boris runs into the bedroom and slams the door. I take it back. One person has an imagination. Nice to see we agree on one thing. But he has also grasped the idea that the world is a terrible place and has thrown himself into a blind rage over it. We agree on two things. I'll drink to that. It's 11 a.m. Your point? We also drank all the alcohol earlier this week during the State of the Union address. <sighs> all right. Henry's phone buzzes and he pulls it out and reads the message. Uh, hey, we doing anything on Friday? Suffering, why? A girl from my modern film class wants to watch Parasite. Ooh, like a date? Uh, no, just uh, two people appreciating a truly brilliant film. Just two people? Yeah. And uh, you positive this isn't a date? Yes. Let me see that. She grabs his phone and reads it over. She used several exclamation points, way too many smiley face emojis, and said, Hey, do you want to come over on Friday to watch Parasite? I'll order dinner. Then, after you said yes, she said, Great, I am really looking forward to spending some quality time with you. And? That is totally a girl who is into you. <laughs> no, just a fellow intelligent mind swimming through a sea of idiots. Well, if her intelligence is anything like yours, we are truly a doomed race. Oh, what do you know anyway? When was the last time you went on a date? Andy thinks on this. It's been a bit, but that's only because I'm focusing on my career. Career? You work as a hostess at a Chili's. You write two chapters of a book and call yourself a novelist. And you watch a girl spell out, I love you, in the sky, and still insist that you're just friends who connect purely on an intellectual level. We are. Have you asked her? No, that would create unnecessary awkwardness. You're impossible. Says the woman who thinks imagination doesn't exist. Oh, so we're bringing that up again. Yeah. If you're so passionate about everything being unique and creative, why is every single movie you watch the greatest movie of all time? It's subjective! It's hypocritical! Can you guys keep it down? I'm trying to search my room for signs that I'm a communist and you two are being very distracting. Shut, Shut up, up, Boris. Boris. I can't believe I expected you not to jump to conclusions. I can't believe I expected you to see past the end of your own nose for once in your own life. Why would I want to do that? Morons like you exist beyond it. Ugh. Boris re-enters very dramatically, ignorant of the argument happening. Good news. I am not a Russian spy. Bad news. There is a camera on my computer. Who knows how long they've been watching my every move. Follow-up question. Do we own a hammer? Check the basement. No way, you're back on my list, Soviet! Just check the basement! Okay, thank you. Boris exits through the basement. Andy and Henry sit in silence. Andy returns to studying her computer. When the awkward tension becomes too much, Henry speaks. So, why were you asking about the Last Supper? Oh, I'm rewriting the Bible. Did you know it's super boring? It needs some livening up. Henry collapses into a chair, utterly defeated, as Andy continues to furiously type on her laptop. The lights fade into a blackout. The end. And that concludes 24 Hours of Quarantine. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to these pieces. I hope that you found something new and interesting, learned a little something about yourself, or were just entertained and had a good evening 
something to distract you from the current world events. For me, I feel the greatest purpose of theater is that it brings us outside of ourselves to live the life of someone else for just a moment. And I hope that that did this for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. This has been hosted by Jove and Lindsay. And shout out to all of the amazing actors and directors and the fantastic writers that poured their hearts and souls into the work today. Good night.